try this. John, can you hear me? There, okay. It's good. Um, can you all hear me besides John? And do I look too stupid in this? <laughs> well, I'm going to be filmed, so it matters. Um, I'm going to talk tonight about scarlet macaws in both the members and at Chaco. I first got interested in macaws because several of us, Steve Pogg, Adam Watson, Steve LeBlanc, and several other people as well, more technical sorts of people, were starting to work on macaws in terms of radiocarbon dating them, doing ancient DNA on them, and we hope in the near future some stable isotope analysis on them. And so as we were doing these technical analyses, um, some of which I'll talk about tonight, um, I started to think, well, geez, you know, the macaws are really used differently in members than they are in Chaco, I think. I can't prove it, but I think they are. And so that's sort of what drew me into this topic. This is my first foray into this comparison between uh, members and Chaco. And so I, I have some results, and some things didn't work out as cleanly as I hoped they would. Um, but here we go. So why members in Chaco? You probably know that these two areas in the southwest are the earliest problem fluorescence. That is the classic members period when they make those beautiful bowls um, is sort of, if you want to call it this, the height of what's members. And at the same time, contemporary, very interesting, AD 1000 to 1130, um, in both places, it's a little scary, um, we see the height of Chaco Canyon as well. And so, and these places are a ways apart, but they're not a huge distance apart. So, um, we also in these two areas see a couple of other things. We see the use of whole macaws for the first time. At 1000 AD to 1130, we see the first whole macaws, whole birds. Um, the whole calm used macaws starting at six or 700 AD. They only use parts. Um, so you get a wing here and a leg there. And that's all you've got. Poor whole calm. Um, <laughs> but in Chaco members, we've got complete birds, live birds. Um, they weren't dead when they got here. So we've got those. We also have, in this 1000 to 1130 time period, the most macaws at that time any place in the southwestern United States or northwestern Mexico. So these are, this is a great comparison, um, at least in my opinion. Okay. Okay. Um, let's look at scarlet macaws first. These are spectacular birds. You've probably seen them. Um, if you haven't, though, they're spectacular birds. They're big birds. They're the largest of the New World parrots, I believe. They're big, and their red tail feathers, critically important here, are as long as the body of the macaw itself. And this is probably the main thing that people here in the ancient Southwest, and modern Southwest perhaps as well, are interested in, is those long red tail feathers. Red's critical. Um, I could argue that these are the most interesting things that people get from farther south in Mesoamerica. They're actually living animals. Um, this beats a little teeny copper bell. It even beats a nice bicemerous <coughs> marine shell bracelet, frankly. What would you rather have, a scarlet macaw or a little copper bell? Um, <laughs> so, these are pretty interesting. Um, they come from the tropical rainforest of Mesoamerica and South. You can see the distribution here on this map. They come from the border between Tamaulipas and Veracruz, and then on South. That's the closest <coughs> to members in Chaco that they are. Uh, uh, the star for the Waztec is a little high there. And so down in here somewhere, um, it's about 700 miles from where the, the most northern area that they live in up to the members, 
And of course, it would be Father Kachako. Um, and as I pointed out, they are contemporary at Members Classic and at Chaco sites, at the height of Chaco, from 1000 to 1130. Uh, oh, and there's a pool, Members Bowl here, of uh, somebody taking a bird, perhaps a macaw, out of a, a, a hole in a tree, which is how macaws nest. And there's one in the little basket, cage-like thing down here, with some arrows. Could be blue jays. <laughs> I don't think so. Um, what are my research questions? At the moment, what they are is, does the presence of scarlet macaws in these two Puebloan traditions, contemporary Puebloan traditions, indicate a similar use and meaning? So, we've got two Puebloan traditions, they aren't that far apart. They're both the fanciest things going on at this point in the Southwest, except for what's happening in the Holocom area, which is completely different. And so you might think that macaws are going to be used in the same way, and that they're going to have the same symbolic meanings in both places. I, I think that's a reasonable assumption. I hope to show you tonight that this, I don't think this is true. Um, secondly, do these scarlet macaws show a relationship between the members and, Chaco, and the people in Chaco Canyon? That is, one of the things that folks have proposed is as these macaws are being brought up from Mesoamerica, from the tropical rainforest, and they are being brought up, and they're not being brought up as eggs, they're not being brought up dead, they're being brought up alive by people. Did, they, did the people stop off at members first? because it's closer, drop off a few macaws, and then continue on north into Chaco Canyon and drop off the rest of the macaws. Um, that is, is there a trade route between members and Chaco? I'm going to suggest tonight that there isn't one. Um, and that I don't see a, these, these birds must have been highly charged uh, religious symbols of some sort. Um, it takes a lot to get them up here, 700 miles. They're kind of nasty birds. Um, they fixate on one person, and um, you don't want to carry one that doesn't fixate on you, certainly when the thing is an adult. Um, and so they're probably bringing up three, four, five month old birds um, into the Southwest. So, um, and, and so, and they're bringing them up, I think, for religious purposes, for ritual purposes. And is there a relationship between the religion that, the parts of the religion that focus on the cause in the Mimbers area and that in the Chaco area? And I'm going to suggest again that there is not, or not much. Okay, let's look at Mimbers first. I started my life, my archaeological life, in the Mimbers region um, with Steve Leblanc, something more than 40 years ago doesn't seem possible. And, and this is what has drawn me to the scarlet macaws. I'm not a Chaco expert, as you're going to see. And so, um, what do we have in Mimbers? We have s some large problems. And the large problems in Mimbers are more than 100 rooms, but less than 200 rooms. So they're big, but they're not huge. There are 13 of them in the Mimbers Valley itself. Um, in a stretch of about 30 miles in the Mimbers Valley, there are 13 of these big poems. And then there are, all told, including that 13, um, about 25 in the entire Mimbers region of southwestern New Mexico. Um, so, there's some, there's some. We have been unable to find, and we've looked, because when you look at those beautiful Mimbers plots, one of the first things that archaeologists think is, well, they must have been for elites because they're so beautiful, right? I, the painting is, is stunning. The subject matter is fascinating. Um, why weren't they for the most important people? They weren't. Um, 70, 80% of the people who die in the Members Valley, who died in the Members Valley, got a single pot, a Members pot. And some of them are pretty nice Members pots. So, there's many other um, 
sources of data, but there don't seem to be any elites. There doesn't seem to be a social hierarchy of that sort in the Mubus Valley. Um, we do think there are religious specialists, um, but they, they're they specialists in religion, but they don't have much to do with any other part of life in the Mubus region. And yes, I do know that religion um, is part of life, of all parts of life. But these people do not stand out. It, they don't have special burials, they don't have special houses, they don't have special anything. Um, but we think they're there. As an example of a large member site, I put a couple pictures of the Maddox site here. I'm gonna make a pitch to you here in a minute. You can see the Maddox site. This is a pretty typical big member site. It's got maybe 180 rooms on it. You can see they're arranged in room blocks here, a bunch of room blocks. Um, there they are. And here is a nice picture of us at the Members Foundation excavating at the Maddox site in the 1970s. The Members River is right here where all this riparian vegetation is. So we're right on the terrace above it. Um, look at that architecture. Does that look chocolate to you? No, no. Does that look <coughs> fancy to you? No. The people in the members area made the worst architecture in the world. Um, they had, we joke, used to joke that they were ball bearings held together with adobe. Uh, you can see some of them here. It's un, unmodified um, cobbles from the river bottom is essentially what it is. They made beautiful pottery. But the architecture stood. That was the most important thing, of course. Now, I've been working on the Maddox site for quite a while uh, on the report. It is at the University of Arizona Press as we speak, um, and it will come out in 2017. So I'm making a pitch to you all that <laughs> if you like this kind of stuff, it will have photographs of every painted member's pot from the Maddox site, and there are several hundred of them. So if you like the member's pottery, this is a good book. Um, okay, so that's members. Compare the Maddox site with Chaco, with Pueblo Bonito. You all know Pueblo Bonito. It's iconic in the Southwest. Um, is there a comparison? Well, not much of one. Um, of course, these great houses like Bonito are much larger than Rivers Pueblos. What does Bonito have? 800 rooms, 700, something in that range? Yeah, that's pretty complicated. Um, got a bunch of great caves in it. Yeah, that's a pretty cool structure. Archaeologists, although when I was in grad school many years ago, we didn't think there was a social hierarchy at um, Chaco, at Benito. We do now. We do now. And interestingly, these elites started to accrue these exotic <coughs> elites, like scarlet macaws and like some other things, earlier than the fluorescence of Chaco. That is, we might have thought, we probably did think, that Elites, when they're fully elite, like after 1000 AD at Chaco, that's the time they get those scarlet macaws because they have the power um, to be able to get them from Mexico. In fact, they're getting them at least in the 900s, maybe into the 800s, because one of the things that scarlet macaws do is they uphold your status. If you have enough status and power and religious sanctity to get yourself a scarlet macaw, then you must be an important person. You must be religiously powerful um, to be able to pull that off. And so they get them early in Chaco. In Chaco. Okay. So what did I look at? I looked at a bunch of things. Some of them worked out better than others. A couple that didn't work out well at all, I, I'm not even gonna show you. But this is what research does. I looked at numbers of scarlet macaws, comparing the two regions, comparing Chaco and Rivers. I looked at the radiocarbon dates that we have for the macaws. We dated the macaw bones themselves. Um, we didn't date anything around them. I looked at the numbers of sites with scarlet macaws in each area. I looked to see whether they were concentrated macaws at any particular site in the area. I looked at, this turns out to be the most important, I looked at the context of the scarlet macaws. You know, we archaeologists love context. 
And without it, we have nothing. And this is going to show you um, how important this is. I looked at presentation media, by which I mean, how do they depict scarlet macaws um, on pottery, on rock art, on ornaments, on kiva murals, on whatever you want to name? Do they depict them? And if so, how? And finally, just for fun, I looked at the presence of the two other macaw parrot types in the Southwest. There's only three. There's the scarlets, they're the most common. There's military macaws, very uncommon. There's thick-billed parrots, also very uncommon. I was just curious what that would do between numbers and chocolate. Okay, so let's look at the first one, which is number of scarlet macaws. So I looked at every bird that could possibly be a macaw. So these numbers may be a little too many. Um, and what we ended up, what I ended up with was that in the members, there's possibly 16 of these birds at the moment. And in Chaco, there's possibly 51 of them. And when I say these possibly in the members, I mean not just in the members valley, but outside. I mean not just in Chaco, but some of the outliers as well. So the region. Now, you might think, well, that's a major difference, and how surprising is that? I mean, Mimbris is this little scruffy place, and the sites aren't very big, and so maybe we would expect to see not so many macaws. Um, and besides, all the sites are so heavily looted that maybe, again, another reason we might not see so many macaws. And Chaco's this big, huge place with huge sites and quite a bit of excavation on those huge sites, especially early on. But, you know, it's just hard to evaluate those numbers. Um, how much has looting affected this? How much has excavating in the big sites affected this? We just don't know. We just don't know. And so I wasn't as happy with this comparison. Um, it didn't, you know, when you think about all the things that could give you these numbers, um, or give you different numbers, there you are. So, I don't know. Okay, so then, I told you we dated the actual macaws. We did radiocarbon dating on little teeny bits of their bone. This is accelerated dating. So just little teeny slivers of the bone. As you look at this chart, this big chunk, this yellow and this green are all Chaco Canyon dates. The blue and the brown here at the bottom are the member states. Okay, so that gives you a way to look at this chart. Um, you've got 900, 1,000, 1,100. So, looking at the three charcoal ones, you've got an early pulse right here that they're getting a bunch of macaws. You've got a middle pulse right here where they get more macaws. And you've got a late pulse where they've got a couple macaws coming in. Is, is that clear? Do I need to? Okay. Um, so, three pulses, it looks like, at the moment. You can see the sample sizes aren't huge. You add another 10 macaws, you might get something quite a bit different here. Um, in the members, we've only done four macaws, and we have a pulse right here, that's one site, and we have this earlier pulse right here that's kind of in the 900s. So it looks like two pulses. None of us like this date. The radiocarbon date is fine. You know, it, it's an accurate date. But this is a little teeny site of about 20 rooms at the north end of the Members Valley. And it only has classic period Members sherds in it. It does not have sherds from the 900s. And so we're not very comfortable with this date, but we don't know what to do with it. I mean, as far as we know, there's nothing wrong with the date. So we're cogitating on this. Okay, then, we, then I looked at number of sites with scarlet macaws. And I thought, going into this, that um, Chaco Canyon, being so big, being so important, might well have many more um, sites with scarlet macaws than the members had. I knew how many the members had. The members has at least six. It could have seven, but six that we're positive of. Um, and interestingly, well, in both places, the macaws are widely distributed. 
You know, I thought that they were going to be at the big sites because I knew in the Rivers Valley that two big sites have quite a number of macaws. But when you look at what we've got, it doesn't pattern out that way. Uh, in the Rivers Valley, we've got um, a couple of large parrot macaws at a couple of large sites within the Members Valley core, in the Members Valley itself, which is the core of things members, for the sake of this argument. Then we've got that small site with the funny date that I just showed you, the Mitchell site. It's 20, 25 rooms. It's also in the Members Valley. Okay. How did they get a scarlet macaw? I have no clue. Then we have macaws at a couple of large sites that are near the core but not in it. Fine. And then we have a scarlet macaw at the Wind Mountain site, which is 60 miles west of the Members Valley. It's a 10 room Pueblo. Again. Oh, come on. <laughs> so we've got macaws inside and outside the Members Valley. We've got them at large and small sites. At Chaco, we've got the same thing. There are four sites in Chaco Canyon three of, that have macaws, three of them are great houses. Not a surprise. Um, there's one small house site that has a macaw. And the, the two great houses of Solomon and Aztec, both outside the valley, but outside the Chaco um, drainage, but not very far as outliers go. Um, so again, six sites. I think that's just coincidence. Um, again, inside and outside, Choc main Chaco, downtown Chaco, and at large sites and small sites. Not what I expected at all. I, I, I just don't know what this means. Um, are the macaws concentrated at particular sites? The answer is yes. They may be widely distributed, but a lot of sites get one macaw or four macaws. At the Galah site, of the 15 birds that are definitely or likely to be macaws, eight of them come from the Galah site. Um, this is the Galah site right here. It is one of the two most important member sites. It has um, a, where is it, it's up here. There is a ritual precinct that dates from earlier pit house times that has three kivas, sequential, sequential. Um, it has a bunch of parrot burials up in here. Um, and there's a number of other things that make us think that Galaz and Old Town, right there, Galaz at the north end of the valley, Old Town at the south end of the valley, that these two are different than other big classic member sites. Uh, that they're more ritually important. And so it's not a surprise to see that a majority, a big chunk of the scarlet macaws that we know about are from the laws. And in fact, most of these are from, um, are buried in the fill of a great kiva. Pretty cool. You, you get the connection? Sort of. Um, so, we've got it at the laws. We also have it at Chaco. Um, 30 of the 47 birds that are likely to have been scarlet macaws, or that definitely were, are from Pueblo Bonito. Here's some walls from inside Pueblo Bonito. Um, and you can see the counts for the other ones. Um, Pueblo Bonito, like Galaz, even more so, outstrips everything else. Uh, it, it's clearly an important site anyway, but the macaws just emphasize that. And and just to remind you, I put this the drawing of Galaz in, and I put this in, just to remind you of the scalar differences between Mirbris and Chaco. Um, but in both places, we see them concentrated at particular sites, and those sites are, you can make an argument, are really important sites. Okay. This is the most important thing. Because the context in which we find the macaws, the scarlet macaws, are almost completely different between Chaco and Mimbris. I did not expect this. In Mimbris, it's pretty varied. Um, but importantly, there are some of the macaws that are buried with human beings, four of them specifically. And there are some, there's some other stuff. And there, 
in several places. At Chaco, the majority of the macaws are found on the floors of rooms, mostly in Pueblo Benito. Um, they're not buried under the floors. They're not buried with human beings. Never, never. Um, in members, they're never on the floor of a room. Uh, they're just never there. There's also some variation at Chaco. And importantly, I think, um, Neil Judd, when he was, uh, brought up the excavation at Pueblo Bonito, makes the comment that there are a number of miscellaneous macaw bones just in the fill, just here and there, you know. And um, you never see that at members. There is never a loose macaw bone at members out there by itself. And so clearly what's happening here is that people at Mimbris, people at Chaco, when they go to put these birds in their final resting places, they do it in a very different way in very different places. I think that speaks to differences in religious concepts of how you treat these birds in death. <coughs> Presentation media. Um, and members, you know, we've got the beautiful pottery. A lot of it's 40-ish percent of it is naturalistic. It has natural um, animal figures on it, people figures sometimes. Um, this particular pot, which is in the Smithsonian, um, has a scarlet macaw on it. And we know it's a scarlet macaw because right here, around its eye, is white. No other macaw has white there around its eyes. So this is definitely a scarlet macaw. Um, it looks to be standing on or next to an obsidian projectile point. I don't know what that means. Um, and we find macaws on, and parrots, we can't, sometimes we can't tell, on reverse pottery. Um, among the many other things they picture, it's not common common, but it's not completely rare either. We find it on Rupert's rock art. Um, here is a, a rock, it's, I think the parrot's about life size on this rock. The rock is about this long, um, and you can see what I would like to think is a macaw. I suppose it could be a parrot, but it's got really long tail feathers, and the thick-billed parrots don't. And you'll notice right here that there is a cross, or maybe it's a flower, I don't know. If it's a cross, I'd like to think that it's a Venus cliff. Um, or it could be a flower from the flower world. We see both of those on Rivers Pottery. I think it designates the bird as a very important bird, is what it does. Um, and this is at Pony Hills. Pony Hills is a, a petroglyph site at the south end, a little off the south end of the Rivers Valley. Uh, on BLM land, quite visitable. And then in members, we also see ornaments, portable art. You can see that this little guy, he's very small, um, made of some sort of green yellow stone. Um, a parrot, maybe, or a macaw, hard to tell, but some sort of bird like this. And, um, and it's at a small site. The old site's about 25 rooms. So, anyway, so we see members macaws being depicted on these media. In Chaco, you know in Chaco there's no representational pottery. There's no, you know, figure, animal or human figures on pottery. There are these very nice uh, cylindrical vases, very famous. They're, and they're famous in part because they appear no place else in the Southwest. And now Patty Crown has, um, within the last several years, demonstrated that there is cacao in them. They look like the cacao pots from Mesoamerica, of course. Um, and so these are important. These are very important. But they're not representational. At Chacha Kettle and Pueblo Benito, there are wooden birds, uh, two that I know of. This one's the one from Pueblo Benito. Very cute. Um, it could be a macaw, could be a parrot. This is a reconstructed bird. You may know that at Chetra Kettle there was a, a room that had a whole bunch of um, wooden artifacts, organic artifacts, that had been, even though it was an exterior, you know, not in a cave room, um, uh, 
organic artifacts preserved in the room. This is reconstructed from several of those, and it's flat. It's not a 3D kind of thing like this bird, but it's flat, and it's called a parrot or a macaw. You can see it doesn't have the white around the eyes and the head is green. I'm not perfectly comfortable with it as a scarlet macaw, but it could be, you know, symbolism being what it is. It might have been the shape of the bird that was more important than the color. Um, don't know, don't know. Um, there is rock art at um, Chanko, of course. Um, they don't have a big macaw like the has. Um, and the rock art, the, the couple figures I've seen from it look exactly like this bird in profile. Um, so again, hard to tell if it's a macaw or a parrot, might not matter. The critical thing here is the no representational pottery designs. Okay, and finally, I looked, just for fun, at the military macaws. These are the militaries right here and the thick-billed parrots, which is this one right here. You can see both of these, or at least you have been able to, out at the Desert Museum, by the way, in case you want to see them live. Um, the military macaws, both of these birds are interesting because they don't come from as far away as the scarlet macaws. The military macaws are from the sort of lower mountain, lower Sierra Madres, um, and historically, they came up into southern Sonora and southern Chihuahua. And so, a very different habitat than the scarlet macaws from the tropical rainforest. You can see they're almost as big as scarlets. Um, they're just a little bit smaller. They're a big bird as well. But look at their tail feathers. They're kind of blue and green. There's a little bit of red, but it's not that bright scarlet red. Um, and so, they're beautiful birds, but they're not scarlet macaws. The thick-billed parrots come from, well, there have been, historically, in the 1900s, thick-billed parrots in the Chiricahua Mountains in southeastern Arizona here, flocks of them. And they reintroduced a flock of them, when? In the 1950s or 60s? And the hawks got them all. So, um, not successful, but then the question is, well, why didn't the hawks get them all in the past? And so there's clearly something we don't understand about why the thick-billed parrots didn't make it the last time they were introduced here. Um, but th so they're from very close by. Um, both of these birds, relatively speaking, are quite close by. So why didn't people in the Southwest use these birds? They're pretty nice birds, right? I mean, they're not ugly. Um, in the rivers, there is one military macaw and four thick-billed parrots. In Chaco, there are two military macaws at Salmon Ruin, maybe, but I want to know more about them um, because I want to know who identified them as military macaws. And because there's a lot of discussion in the Southwest about how you tell a military macaw from a scarlet macaw by the bones, um, because the parrots, are all, the birds are almost the same size, and there are some distinctions, but. Um, Bird bone people argue about this. Um, and Chaco has a couple of thick billed parrots as well. I might have thought that Chaco would have no thick billed parrots because it's quite a bit farther away. Uh, but there are a couple of them at Benito. At the Galaz site, now I, so I'm going to make a point here that even though they don't use many of them, of the militaries, and there's, I know of two for sure in the Southwest, I think there's a third, not counting these two. Um, and that's all. Uh, so there's two or three known military macaws in archaeological sites in the Southwest that I'm sure of. And so you might think they're, they're unimportant. But here at the Galaz site, you remember, one of the big uh, important sites in the Rivers Valley, in one of the great kivas, uh, which dates before the classic period, on the floor of the great kiva, there, it was this rock right here, and it was buried about a quarter of its height down into the floor. And when they moved the rock, which they've done here, there are the military macaw bones right there. That's the one from the Mimbrus region. It's in a kiva, it's in an important kiva, not just any kiva, and it's buried below this green stone. 
and the excavators describe that stone as being polished smooth by hands rubbing it. Um, clearly, the stone is important. The macaw is important. The macaw was buried with um, strings of beads wrapped around its legs and strings wrapped around its body, hundreds of marine shell, turquoise, and stone beads, hundreds of them. This was an important bird. Um, why? There aren't many, many other important military macaws in the Southwest. We don't have a clue. I don't have a clue. So this turned out to be so similar. I can't, I can't make anything of it. But I think there's more to this. Um, I just don't know what it is yet. Okay. So um, I did a chart for myself looking at similarities, which are down here in black and differences which are down here in red. I have my seven measures. I have members in chocolate. So you remember the number of scarlet macaws I couldn't make much of. Maybe we aren't surprised that there are so many in Chaco and relatively fewer in members. But I remind you that even that is more than any place else in the Southwest at this time period. The C14 dates, we've got one or two pulses versus three. Again, I'm not sure I can make much of this, especially with that one funny date in members. Um, hopefully we're going to have some more C14 dated macaws in the near future, and maybe that will help clarify this pattern. Numbers of sites, again, turned out to be pretty similar. Um, and both in and out of the core, both large and small sites, I think this is something we can poke at some more. To under, try to understand this pattern a bit more. Are they concentrated at one site? Yes, they are in both places. But then the question that begs the question of well, what are they doing at the other sites? Why aren't all the birds at one site? Why aren't they all at Pueblo Bonito? Why aren't they all at the laws? Were religious leaders gifting specific, uh, a bird or two to somebody else, another religious leader who was important that they wanted a connection to? I have no idea. The context, I think, are the most important. In the members, the contexts are quite varied, but they're quite often with human variants. In Chaco, it's mostly room fills of floor, room fill of floors, um, never with human variants. And I think this is one of the things that helps demonstrate that things are very different. The interpretation, the use of scarlet macaws, very different in the two places. The same is true with the pottery. In members, they put them on the pots. In Chaco, they don't. My husband would point out that Chaco does not have a tradition of representational uh, designs on the pottery. Um, and that is true. Uh, they could have, though. They could have. They chose not. Um, and the presence of the militaries and the parrots um, doesn't seem to indicate much at the moment. Again, future research. So what does this mean? The two critical differences are, are in context of presentation on the pots. I think both the context of the macaws in their final resting places has some ritual um, importance. And so does the presentation of macaws on the member's classic pottery. So, um, both are important for ritual uses. I think they're more important than other measures are for ritual uses, and that's what's popping out here. These suggest, these differences suggest that there's little connection between members and Chaco in terms of sharing the same religion, or at least the part of the religion that deals with scarlet macaws. Um, they use the scarlet macaws differently, they portray them differently, um, and probably, therefore, these macaws function differently in their religious and social lives. Supporting this nicely is recent research by several of us, Steve Plogg, Adam Watson, Steve LeBlanc, and some technical folks, um, that suggests that people from Chaco and people from members obtain the scarlet macaws from different parts of Mesoamerica. <laughs> so cool. Um, we did this with ancient DNA, and the members, macaws, 
have different haplogroups, I think that's, the, no, haplotypes, than the ones from Chaco Canyon, suggesting that genetically they come from different populations of birds. And so it suggests that people from Chaco were getting birds from different areas. This is all that, that northern part of the distribution of scarlet macaws. I mean, they weren't going deep into Mesoamerica or into South America for the macaws. But right there at the top, um, it looks like people from Chaco, whether they went down themselves or whether people from Mexico brought them up, were getting slightly different uh, macaws with slightly different DNA than were the ones from rivers. It supports the idea that um, they're using the macaws very differently. Then, what are the implications of this? I think a lot of times when we think about the movement of exotic items from long distances, or even short distances for that matter, um, we think about the point of origin and how important that is, which it is, um, and we think about the item itself, scarlet macaws. Scarlet macaws are moving from Mesoamerica into the southwest and then they move across, you know, across the southwest. What I'm suggesting here is that we now know enough that we can start to say, and we are, um, that we also want to know once the, the items get here, and this would apply not just to scarlet macaws, but to things like copper belts and marine shell, that we want to know how people are using them. Are they using them in the same way across the southwest? I think in all of those items, it's pretty clear they're not. Um, and in, with scarlet macaws, it's pretty clear they're not. And uh, so it's not just a question of origin, but it's a question of how people use the items. And that there's a lot of complexity in studying these exotic items. It's not just saying, counting up the numbers of scarlet macaws across the southwest, which I love doing, by the way. But it, there's more to it than that. Um, and so we're at a point now we know enough, we've got enough data that we can start poking at this stuff in a more nuanced, finer matter, manner. I put macaws are cool because they are cool. They're beautiful birds, um, even the green one, even the militaries, they're beautiful birds. And, but you don't ever want to own one, in my opinion, because apparently they squawk for several minutes at a time, several times a day, and you can hear the squawking for up to a quarter of a mile away. Your neighbors aren't gonna like this. Um, but they are stunningly beautiful birds that were very important at some point, starting at about 1000 AD, I think, here in the Southwest. They remain, have remained important birds in the Pueblos um, since then. And while I know nothing about modern Pueblo life, my guess is that they may still be important today. So, and they can start to show us more about materials coming from Mesoamerica into the Southwest and what those relationships must have meant in the past um, as we delve deeper into this. So that's what I have to say. Thank you. or any of your other sites, I mean, do you have other rainforest animals, I mean, remains of iguanas or any other animals? No, no. no. Let me repeat the questions. Oh, okay. So the question, the first question is, do modern Maya have any um, ritual uses for scarlet macaws? And the second question is, um, do we find any other tropical animals from the tropical rainforest in southwestern sites like Pueblo Bonito. Let me answer the second one first, because it's easier. Um, and the answer is no. No iguanas, no, what else would they be? Interestingly, a couple of people, and this came up at supper, um, have said, well, what about the Quetzal birds? You know, they have the beautiful green, um, and that come from the rainforest, perhaps a bit further south, but I don't really know that that's true. Uh, why don't we have Quetzal birds in the Southwest, and we don't. 
We don't. Those birds were very important in Mesoamerica, but we never see them in the Southwest. I speculate that the answer is they weren't red. Um, that what people in the Southwest wanted was red. They didn't want the military macaws, they didn't want the thick-billed parrots. Those were just, in, for the most part, poor substitutes for scarlet macaws. They wanted the scarlet macaws. The Quetzal birds weren't very interesting. Or they didn't have access to them. That could be true, too. I really don't know about the modern Maya. I'm looking at Arthur. Um, in, in the past, in ancient Maya and Maya archaeology, um, there's a lot of reference to scarlet macaws. Um, in the Stella, um, that sort of thing, in the written material. And, but I don't know whether modern Maya use, think about um, scarlet macaws in ritual. I wouldn't be surprised if they did, but they I just don't show up in some of the codices. Yeah, they do. They do. Um, three quick questions. Um, do any of the three species you've been talking about show an ability to mimic human speech? Yes. Do any of the three species I'm talking about uh, mimic human speech? Yes. Certainly the scarlets do. I don't know specifically about the other two, but many macaws and parrots do, and so I would imagine they do. And so, partway through this research, I, I had this vision of somebody, either somebody from Mimbris or somebody from Mesoamerica, walking into a Mimbris village with a scarlet macaw on their shoulder, um, or in a basket on their back, sticking the head out, um, with those beautiful long red tail feathers speaking in the local language. Can you imagine what that must have been like? Uh, it would have blown people away. Can you imagine what that would do to your status as a powerful religious person if you did that? You brought back this living thing from hundreds of miles away that was bright red and that spoke your language. I mean, you'd be um, religious leader forever, unless you would. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think that must have been an important part of these birds. Do you know what the, the life expectancy of any of them are? And can uh, you have been secondary to that would be, can you tell archaeologically? In the bones? Yes and no. Um, the life expectancy in the wild is several decades. The life, and I don't want to, I can't remember specifically, um, but the life expectancy in captivity can be 70 plus years. Another reason you don't want one, because it's going to outlive you. <laughs> and your relatives aren't going to want it. Well, that's what I was getting something that you probably couldn't could prove archaeologically but would be interesting is, especially if those two birds that are at the smaller outlying sites, what if they're on their third or fourth caretaker? And as you said, the birds <laughs> often have quite a say in mm -hmm. who their caretaker is. Yes. That if there was some sort of something, you might get them archaeologically how we prove it, but if there was a way that when the caretaker passed on, the bird had a big say, that would make a lot of sense for yeah. the bird being yeah. It turns out that most, this is one of the slides I left out because it doesn't tell us much. Most of the birds live to be 11 to 12 months old. So the bird faunal people tell us. Um, and, and Lyndon Hargrave, who was the bird faunal person, um, wrote a book on Mexican macaws in the Southwest in 1970. And he and his student, Sean McCusick, um, in fact, it's mostly Sean that said this, and other people have since said it. Many of these birds are born in March, April or so. And if they're 11 or 12 years old, months old when, they're, when they die, then they're dying near the spring equinox, right? So are they sacrificed? Or Sean McCusick thought they were. Now, Patty Crown just published an article in Kiva that is available online right now. I have not read the whole thing, but she says, you know these birds can be born, born any place, I'm making this up, like from November to May. 
Um, and so maybe this model doesn't hold up so well. And, and she could easily be right. And she says, you know, Lyndon Hargrave and other people have said, well, um, these birds are newly fledged at 11 to 12 months. But fledging means leaving the nest, and these birds leave the nest long before that. And so, so she says, this doesn't make any sense. I think what makes sense is that Hargrave and others have put the birds into three or four categories in terms of age. There's the four to 11 months age chunk. There's nothing before four months, by the way. No little baby birds. Um, and then there's the 11 to 12 month chunk. <coughs> and then there's a kind of one to four year chunk. They start breeding in the fourth or fifth year. Um, so pre-breeding. And then there's a kind of breeding slash aged group. That group is extremely small, like fewer than 10 birds in the Southwest, maybe fewer than five. Um, most of them are in the 11 to 12 month range, then some are in the 4 to 11, and then some are in that adolescent pre-breeding, but not very many. And so most of the birds don't make it <laughs> to change owners. Um, somehow they all seem to die. <laughs> do they, can you tell if they just die or if uh, do the remains indicate any other? You, you can't tell whether they just died or whether they were sacrificed on purpose because apparently the way Puebloans have traditionally sacrificed at least some birds is by smothering them, by either crushing their sternum, uh, just pressing down on it, um, not necessarily breaking it, but pressing down on it so they can't breathe or smothering them in some other way. So there's no bone evidence. It's just that sort of year cycle thing at the spring equinox. Um, and, and the fact that they all seem to die at 11 to 12 months. Ooh. Go ahead. Is there anything to suggest whether you might have had a small breeding population that produced the younger birds for sacrifice? Or is it more likely they were brought in continually we think they were brought in as continually as people could get them here. We don't know how many failed trips there were. You know, you're not going to be the religious leader if you die on the trail. Um, and so a lot of these trips must have failed. That's a very dangerous trip. Physically, it's also a dangerous trip spiritually. And so, you know, um, what, what was your first part of that question? Well, is there evidence that perhaps they were bred Breeding. from a small population? The only evidence we have for that is at Pocky May in Chihuahua, um, which is later in time, which is post 1250-ish or so. Um, we don't see any evidence of breeding in either rivers or Chaco. Um, there are no breeding cages. There's, there's, um, there's nothing like what we see at Chaco and at, at Casas Grandes. Um, and we, and I think importantly, we don't see those birds that are pretty four months old. Um, some of those must have died. Some of those must die in any circumstances, you know, when you're breeding birds. And we just don't see them in the Southwest. And, and a question would be, do we see them at Chaco? And I don't know the answer to that. Um, I, well, my comment there is also these birds are extremely fragile in their uh, youth, in their, in their first birth. Very, very young, they are very susceptible to chill. And so they, they die off very quickly uh, if they get it all cold. Uh, the other question, though, I had was in the rooms at Chaco, in, in the members' imagery that you see on the pottery, there's a number of images of people handling uh, birds, possibly macaws. Uh huh, yeah. Um, in the rooms at Chaco, is there any evidence to suggest? Those rooms could have been Avery's or anything like that to so, handle the birds? Yes. There is, shoot, I don't remember the room number. At Pueblo Bonito, there's a room that I think it was Judd thought was an aviary because it had a lot of uh, bird uh, guano and in it. And I think there may be another room like that, too, that has a lot of bird guano in it. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's entirely possible. Um, but these rooms, like the one room at Benito that I remember, 
has no windows, no, and just one entrance, and the entrance is deep inside the problem. It's not an outside entrance at all. Um, and so the birds had no natural light. They were eating food that was not their normal fruit from the tropical rainforest. They're eating roasted corn and pinon nuts and, and stuff. These are not happy, healthy birds. I think that wasn't the point. I think nobody cared if they were happy and healthy. Um, they needed to serve another purpose. John, just yeah, just one thing that uh, kind of strikes me is uh, when we're talking about all you different kinds of elements, uh, them showing up on ceramics, them showing up on rock art, to me that suggests something that's pretty prevalent, but when you actually talk about the numbers, it's a very small sample. And so I'm, I'm wondering, you know, in terms of the kind of research you've done, in terms of you know, you're, you're doing archaeological work in terms of old manuscripts and a variety of other sorts of things. Do you think that these small numbers are just the tip of the iceberg? Or do you think it's the kind of thing where there actually weren't that many cause per se, but the, the social realm, the ritual realm, and, and the iconography is much more important than the actual I, I think that's true, that the, the ritual realm is more, is as important as the actual birds, but I should preface that by saying that macaws and parrots on members' pots, uh, one of my master's students, Christina Wyckoff, <coughs> found 36 <coughs> pots that have macaws or parrots or birds that look like that in members. That's out of probably six, seven thousand members classic pots. So that's not a lot. Let's say there's even 50. There's some that are in private hands that we don't know about. Let's even say there's 100 of them. That's still not very many um, macaw pots or parrot pots. And the same is true, I think, in rock art. I don't know rock art even in members very well, but, um, but I don't think there are lots of macaws and parrots being depicted. And so, you know, maybe it goes along with the small number. But I think the number, let's say there are 16 that I suggested, and there's probably more, you know, out there. Let's say there's even 50 of them. Everybody's gonna know these birds. Everybody's gonna see them at rituals. Um, everybody's gonna know when a new one comes in or new ones. Um, these are important things. So even though they may not be huge numbers of them, they're still going to be pretty important and pretty much a part of people's lives, ritual lives, anyway. Has anybody had any thoughts about what might have been traded for the birds? Okay, I put trade in quotes there because I don't think this is trade. I think that people are going to Mexico to get these birds and to get the, the practical knowledge you've got to have to keep one alive to get up here to the north and then to keep it alive in order to do whatever it is you're going to do with it um, until it <laughs> dies in 12 months. Um, or the people are coming up from Mexico for the same purpose. I think a, a, one person carries each macaw or several macaws. They don't want to, you know, numbers of people. So I think it, it requires one person making the whole trip. Um, I could be wrong about that. And there's nothing in Mesoamerica from members or Chaco. There could be some turquoise. That's always been the idea, that it was turquoise from the mines here in the Southwest. But more and more, it's becoming clear that the turquoise in Mesoamerica, and I mean not Chihuahua Sonora, I mean father, you know, in real Mesoamerica, um, is coming from local sources in Mesoamerica. I'm looking at our, yeah, yeah, unclear, okay. Um, could be wrong there. Um, I don't think if you go on this kind of a religious journey that you need to bring anything with you but your willingness to learn about the ceremonies and um, the care of the birds, that sort of thing. That you go down, you essentially apprentice with somebody who's willing to take you on, 
perhaps not everyone is. And then at the end of it, which could be many months, a year, two years, more, um, there are such apprenticeships in um, historic problems. They talk about such things um, within the problems. I'm, and then I think you come back with a bird and the knowledge in your head about how to make this work. Um, there's a lot of holes, potential holes in that argument, but um, I don't see any trade happening. I don't see anything going down there. Just to clarify, in your charts, you're talking about 200, 300 years? In the radiocarbon chart. Yeah, when you're, when you're showing all yeah a couple hundred years, years, certainly. So if you're only finding 15 birds, they're so important, why are they killing them a year old? You would think that that would be the rear bird. Well, you would. You would think you wouldn't kill a bird that was so important to you ritually. But I think <coughs> if they are killing the birds, if they're sacrificing them, and I think that's highly possible, um, I think the act of sacrifice is the critical thing. It's not keeping the bird. If you keep the bird, its value disappears. It's the sacrifice of the bird that makes it valuable. It's, it's not a lot. No. For those extended periods of time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Think about religion. Think about what people do in their religions, what they sacrifice, um, and, and the religious trips that people make to Mecca. Um, when you can. That's a long trip for a lot of people. If you're a Muslim in Indonesia, for example, going to Mecca, it's a huge expense. Um, and, and, and for what? You know, if you're not religious, you might say, well, for what? why would you do that? Um, but it's clearly very important. People make major sacrifices, not just Makkah sacrifices, for their religions and for what they think is the right thing to do. So. Killing the car seems like a small thing. As far as that religious trip goes, was it the established group that was taken? It was it the same group from Chicago down to Mexico? Was it from Memphis down to Mexico? It looks like they, we don't know. We don't have, well, we have some clues from the historic records. Um, if, the, if people in Chaco and people in the members are getting their macaws from somewhat different areas of that, uh, of the northern part of the Scarlet Macaw distribution, then they perhaps did have um, separate routes that they took. Um, but I don't have a sense of that. Um, my guess is they'd have a separate route. Yeah. So the advantage to having a, a live macaw is that they molt. Yes. And you get yes. feathers. You get or the they might have been treated just like they treated the turkeys where they plucked them. They do pluck them because the ulnas on the vast majority of these macaws um, have um, indications on the bone that they've been plucked repeatedly. Again, these are not happy birds. Um, and so they're, they're going for the tail feathers, they're going for the wing feathers. Um, but again, the question would be, if you want the feathers so badly, why do you then sacrifice the birds at 12 months? Um, and so. so. So the whole comp, uh -huh. you just have fragments of macaw. You just have fragments. How do you Most get a fragment of a macaw? You mean a wing? Yeah, they get some wings. Um, I think the wings are moving north. They don't get, they don't get the whole bird. Um, the wings are moving north. On the west coast of Mexico, the farthest north that you can get scarlet macaws, the tropical rainforest, is in Oaxaca, which is another 700 miles. And so I think it's just too far for the live birds, and they're getting parts. And it, I'm unconvinced, there are so few in the whole calm area that I'm unconvinced that they're a major, I'm looking at Paul and Susie, part of what's going on. You've also got the dryness of the whole The birds, the birds could not survive in this dry, arid environment. Uh -huh. It's too hot. It's too hot. Too hot and too dry at, at the same time, yeah. Um, so they probably thought they were lucky to get a wing. 
<laughs> Are there any historic ornithological collections from which you could get samples to do haplotype comparisons? Um, you mean historic, like 1700s, 1800s? Probably 1800s. Yeah, they, 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 I don't know. I don't know. Because obviously there's likely to have been plenty of modern interchange of birds, but if you could go back a couple of centuries. Yeah, although they sort pretty well do they? by the genetics, yeah. Uh -huh. um, and by what we understand of the modern genetics, which I think is quite a bit right now for a scholar of us. Because what, what archaeologists are tapping into in the genetics of scarlet macaws, of modern ones, is the illegal bird trade. And they DNA individual birds um, and then track them through the, um, the illegal system of distributing these birds. So we actually know a lot about scarlet macaw DNA, it turns out. That could really help define source, yes. source lines. Yes, yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you.